Scientists who worked here went on to win Nobel Prizes, which is quite extraordinary. And ten of the chemical elements were discovered here. Uh, so the building has an incredible history, and we really felt that when we did the refurbishment. Um, and uh, you'll see that we did some major changes, including a triple height space that was kind of knocked through downstairs, and uh, telling the story of, of the uh, building in order to engage with the public and a wider audience. Um, so, um, and as Farrells, we continue to be involved in lots of exciting projects around the world. Uh, but tonight's not about Farrells, it's, it's very much about um, Kerry and his achievements uh, and being recognised with this particular uh, accolade. And um, it's the first of a number of talks. We're, we're off to Hong Kong next week and we're giving a tour there. Uh, and um, then at the World Architecture Festival, uh, which Paul Finch is uh, here in the audience is organised in Berlin uh, in November. You'll see there's a booklet which uh, people should have, which has a, an essay in it, which was uh, written by Terry about um, some of the thoughts that, that he'll touch on in the talk tonight. Um, but I suppose just to um, round off before we get to the talk, I'll, I'll explain a bit about the format uh, and also some housekeeping, if there happens to be anything uh, hurricane related or not, uh, there's uh, emergency exits that you can all see and, uh, and uh, that's uh, the obvious routes out. Um, and um, we're going to have the talk from Terry which will last about 45 minutes, something like that, and then we'll have a panel discussion and we're really, really delighted to have such an excellent panel here this evening, um, chaired by Greg Clark. Uh, and, uh, and uh, we'll open that up to questions from the audience as well, so hopefully it can be an interactive thing. And then we'll have drinks afterwards, uh, where we were before, in the library and the Georgian room. Um, so just on behalf of uh, Farrell family, but also the office, which is the extended Farrell family, uh, we um, just like to say how very proud we are of, of Terry and uh, all his achievements. You'll see that there's a CV in the back of this, which is actually cut down. We had to do several editions and versions cutting it down. That's the short version of the CV, so that was the, the best we could do. Um, and before I hand over to Stephen Wilkinson, the, the uh, president of the RTPI, to talk a bit about uh, the medal and what it means, uh, I just thought I'd show a short film. And uh, the film... Uh, was made by my brother, who's here tonight, and uh, any opportunity to embarrass him is always uh, good to do, so there he is. And uh, he, he um, uh, did the film on behalf of a client uh, that was about uh, a sort of motivational film for their company and their staff about um, people that achieve things in life. So I thought this is a good time to show it. Uh, so perhaps we can cue, cue the film. I grew up on a council estate. I love drawing, I love painting, but I had no idea that my life would unfold the way it has. I always wanted to be an architect from 14 years old, to do my own thing, be my own boss. I set up my own practice straight from college. Having gone up the ladder that I have, I see the connections better than if I'd started off at the top. For me, drawing from life and drawing from nature and cities was very important. Architecture, it's a very, very public art. 
when you put a building up, everyone sees it. The audience is the world. I think cities are absolutely extraordinary. What makes a city? Why is Paris different to New York or Tokyo or Hong Kong? I went to the Far East fairly early on in my lifetime. That part of the world has transformed itself. Shenzhen, for example, was a small fishing village, and now it's got about 12 million people, and that's in 50, 60 years. Cities are organized complexity, but what we're doing now is mastering aspects of that complexity. I have made a particular study of what I would call the DNA of place. There is something in the essence of cities that is almost greater than a great painting, a great film, a great play. The city itself is an act of creativity. Today, people go into great cathedrals like Notre Dame as tourists. They go to experience how the world was viewed four, five, six hundred years ago. They go for other reasons than the designers of the building intended. I find it very difficult to deal with the subject of predicting the future. But in architecture and city making, you have to have a good stab at it. What you can do right now is build well, build robustly, build flexibly, so that you give the best chance for the future to use what you're doing. And that can be an enormously powerful legacy. Now I'm going to hand over to Stephen Wilkinson, the president of the RTPI. Okay, um, thank you, Max. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to Terry. Um, it gives me great pleasure of being here tonight for this event to really celebrate your work and considerable achievements. Uh, whilst tonight's really been occasioned by the award of the gold medal by the Royal Town Planning Institute, for your enormous contributions to planning, urban design, and architecture. It's as much a celebration of your career over the last 50 years. The gold medal is the highest award that the Institute can give, and previous recipients have included Sir George Pepler, Sir Patrick Abercrombie, Peter Hall, and Sir Peter Hall. And more recently, it's been awarded to Professors Patsy Healy and Michael Batty and Alison Nimmo. It's given to honor people who made a significant contribution in the promotion of the science and art of town planning. Now, over the last 50 years, Sir Terry has emerged as one of the world's most influential architects and planners. In a career distinguished as much by major uh, master planning activity as by multi-award winning placemaking and designing great buildings here in the UK and internationally. After graduating in architecture from Newcastle University, and receiving a Harkness Scholarship to study city planning at the University of Pennsylvania. So Terry's career as a consultant commenced in the 1960s before setting up as Terry Farrell and Partners, which subsequently morphed into Farrell's. Now, a defining ethos of the practice's work has been to break down those artificial barriers which too often exist between architecture and planning, and which sometimes bedevil schemes as they move from the drawing board to the site. And Sir Terry's approach is to consistently focus on creating and shaping places that are designed around how people actually live and work, to make them not only uh, function better, but also make them beautiful places as well, and also, importantly, very importantly, livable. And I won't attempt to recap his all its extensive CV, as you've heard from Max, actually. It's truly impressive. But just to name a, a few schemes, He's developed successful master plans in the UK, including that for his hometown in Newcastle, Newcastle Quayside, and here in London at Embankment Place, Paddington Basin, and the Greenwich Peninsula. Sir Terry's also had a considerable international profile, particularly in Asia, with major architectural and planning commissions in Beijing, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and South Korea. His KK100 tower, which I think we saw in the presentation in Shenzhen, is the tallest building ever designed by a British architect. Now, throughout his career, 
He's championed urban planning and helped shape government policy at key, uh, on key issues. As recognition of this in 2013, he was voted the individual who'd made the greatest contribution to London's planning and development over the previous decade. And indeed, Sir Terry became one of the then London Mayor Boris Johnson's design advisors. He's the design champion for the Thames Gateway, Europe's largest regeneration project, and master planner for the transformation of Vauxhall, Holborn, and Earl's Court. I don't know whether that's all in one go, actually, or that stage, actually. And for five years, he was the city's design champion for Edinburgh. At the request of government, he led the Farrell Review of Architecture and the Built Environment. And the review took a holistic perspective of the built environment and made various recommendations which helped to embed planning and into placemaking, including turning design review panels into placemaking, place review panels. The integration of professional disciplines to deliver an improved built environment and that planning applications for large schemes should include an analysis of operational and embedded carbon during their lifetime. Now, the review was described by the culture minister, at the time, I think it's Ed Vasey, as the most thorough, wide-ranging exercise that's taken place in this sector. Many of its recommendations have been carried through into the planning and development world by the Place Alliance, with a growing number of the community-focused urban rooms proposed in the review. So across the built environment professions, Sir Terry is considered a thought leader, having written several influential publications. He holds honorary doctorates from five universities and visiting professorships at UCL, University of Westminster and Newcastle. He shares my view that planning is a highly creative and proactive endeavor that has the potential to beneficially transform places for, people's, for people and their communities. He was awarded an OBE in 1978, a CBE in 1996, and 90 in 2001 for his contribution to architecture and urban design. So it's fitting that this event is being held here in the institution founded by Polymaths, Robert Boyle, and John Wilkins. Because in many respects, Sir Terry is a true polymath, perhaps a polymath for planning. So on behalf of the Royal Town Planning Institute, it's a great honor for me to present the gold medal. It's slightly overwhelming, all this. Um, I, when I was a boy, I wanted to, more than anything, to, uh, to win um, a gold medal in the Olympics for, for a marathon, marathon running. But um, I never realized I was going to uh, go on a career that was several marathons long, which is uh, in architecture and planning. And, uh, I'm very honored and thank you very much for all you've said. I'm going to give uh, a talk uh, with slides, um, which uh, I will do now. Uh, and there is a, um, a panel that is going to have discussions afterwards. Uh, I need to come out here because you need, uh, it's, it's very difficult to see the slides from here. Do you excuse me turning my back on you? Um, the, the most important thing I can think about city making is that it is an extraordinary thing. It is, uh, it's greater than music, greater than, than, than painting, sculpture. It's the greatest of the arts. But it's, who does it? Is it design? Is it planning? Is it something else? Is it politics? <coughs> Um, when we look at um, Bologna um, in Italy, which you, you could replace Bologna with uh, so many classical great cities. And, um, uh, and I'm very, very grateful to Google Earth, because in, in this day and age, uh, you, can, uh, you can capture um, uh, so much uh, that 
is invisible or has been invisible beforehand, uh, before now. Um, but the, the, the lessons of Bologna is, is, are that there's no individual artist, but it's in, unbelievably creative. And there is not even a collective uh, set of many hands creating this at one point in time. You can't say it was a committee or a, a group of friends or a political era because it's happened over time and it's still happening. And next to it, I've put some streets in Fulham because London is extraordinary um, uh, and unlivable. And what I particularly like about this, uh, this slide is that it's accumulation of many factors at work um, which happened over time. There are, you can see uh, the different houses that were built in series by individual house builders. You can see all the back gardens um, uh, with, with enormous biodiversity, ecologically the richest part of the whole of the southeast of England is these back gardens that repeat. Um, there are eight million trees in London. There are three million back gardens. And yet they're produced by building streets and having corner shops and factories. They're, um, they're a product, uh, uh, an, an accumulative product that has evolved with no single hand behind it. And that is an extraordinary thing because they're in themselves um, they're rich, diverse, ecologically. They are beautiful. They, they, they have great demand um, to live here. And we all know that in London that it, it, we live in, um, in this time and this age uh, in, in a very favoured place. Um, and yet, who, who did it? And, and, and that, is, that is an extraordinary thing in our time when our artists have become singular and they're, they're known for... And, and I, I've, I find this separation between what is collective and what is individual absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's not just here, it's uh, in the New World. This is New York, of course. Um, uh, a wonderfully spectacular uh, image from, uh, I think, from <laughs> The Guardian. And this is Google Earth again. This is uh, Philadelphia that I know well. And it was laid out. There are four squares. Uh, there is a big diagonal. But on the other hand, there are lots of players on this stage and lots of players over time. And even one bit of it will change. And when we look at New York and Philadelphia or anywhere, it's changing all the time. And it's changing in spite of us uh, individually. It, collectively, it adds up to something quite extraordinary. And I think cities are our greatest achievement. Uh, and yet, they're anonymous. And then in the Far East, uh, this is Hong Kong. This is uh, in a most extraordinary place that um, no one else in their right mind had ever built in there. Uh, the British inherited it or won it uh, by wars and uh, by conniving and uh, whatever. But um, it is now a, a, a different place to what anyone ever envisaged. It, it's a different place to the earlier cities. It's grown networks and connectivity. It almost is, a, this is a, a computer diagram. This is the ultimate um, today of a smart city. And yet when you look at the streets, again, it's, there, there, is, there are no buildings in this image. There are, there's traffic, there's movement, there's the choreography of streets, 
but it's all signs and symbols. And I think that is, um, that is, tends, that is the tendency of modern cities, of signs and symbols. Let's go back very briefly to what the Town Planning Institute began with the award of the gold medal. This is Patrick Abercrombie. I don't think he was the first, but he was one of the first. What was he? <laughs> well, um, of course, town planners, town planning existed long before town planners. Uh, goes back in history uh, to a DNA of um, of place making. That is, there's a marketplace, there's a there's a place of worship, there's hospitals, there's residential areas, there's shops uh, accumulating. There is a natural order to human habitat. And the conscious application of ideas and design, if you could call it design, uh, by an individual to that, um, became, uh, in the middle of the century, in the middle of the last century, became uh, uh, much more favoured. But has grown out of favour very rapidly. Because Abercrombie, whilst he came up with many things that were of value, uh, have proved of value, like the M25, green belts, new towns, this is an extraordinary uh, diagram of his proposal post-war. Actually, it was before the war ended, of a ring road that went across the top of Primrose Hill right through Camden Town, right through Maida Vale, and it slammed through every bit of what we now value in London. And, um, and th this, wind forward 20 years, this was my first job with Buchanan, um, the, the only job I ever had, um, <laughs> which was 1963. And this is the plan for Tottenham Court Road. That is the intersection of Tottenham Court Road and Euston Road. This is Great Portland Street bridging over what is, uh, can only be described as a limited access motorway, building on uh, this, this, this notion here. And there is uh, Fitzroy Square, uh, uh, and uh, the, the, that's Tottenham Court Road. But the, the one thing that Buchanan did is he started to uh, give choices. So this is the extreme range. He then had a medium range, and then had a low range of how much cities could take the motor car. And he, uh, instead of prescribing the regime top down like Abercrombie did, he's beginning to pose the question of choice. And that was in the 60s. And in the 70s, then, we saw choice run rampant. And that's when town planning, as this kind of thing, began to change radically with Covent Garden, Archway in London, uh, the road plans questioned. And it came bottom up. Uh, it came from uh, community groups, uh, Covent Garden Community Association, among others. It came um, as a rebellion against uh, the top-down uh, political solutions that were blamed on uh, planners and politicians, very rarely on architects and designers. Um, they've, they've always managed to escape relatively unscathed. Um, but they, the, nevertheless, um, the climate changed. And then town planning went into reverse. It became a bureaucratic exercise. It became um, uh, a, a uh, it became the the gatekeepers um, between the politicians and the architect and developers. It um, it be it became what I've called the traffic wardens of the built environment. And I think that the time for planning and collective uh, thinking needs to be rethought in our time because um, 
there are so many good examples of town planning, whether it's um, King's Cross or what have you, Newcastle Quayside. Um, there are great successes uh, in town planning today. And town planners uh, have been forced into a corner um, uh, as bureaucrats. But I, I think that the emergence of town planning as of great value uh, is, is, uh, is, is self-evident to us all now because cities uh, are bigger than, than all of us. Next one. Oh, sorry. Uh, down to here. Uh, I, I, I put these two slides together because it's, uh, it's about planning versus design. This is the thought of as non-design. And this is clearly an act of design, just like um, Plan Voison uh, by Corbusier was. Corbusier um, uh, uh, invented the phrase, a uh, house is a uh, machine for living in. And you could follow that, that a city is a machine uh, to inhabit. And in a way, this, there's more life in here because it, there are workers in here. The, that sewage works. This is a uh, workplace. And there are indeed houses here. And you need houses to walk, uh, to work. And there are no doubt canteens and, and presumably that's a cemetery. Uh, so you lived your life and you worked and <laughs> you died. And, the, and there's probably a chapel in here. There's probably medical facilities and so on. And that is uh, a part of human life and, and, and its manifestation in town planning, which, in a way, this is not. Uh, and these are two very important slides uh, for me because uh, th these are two hospitals, uh, Dundee and Charing Cross. And in each of them, there is a Maggie Center. This was one uh, designed by Frank Gehry. And this was one designed by um, uh, Richard Rogers. And they have received an unbelievable amount of uh, exposure uh, because, and rightly so, they're brilliant pieces of design by brilliant designers. And this one even won the Sterling Prize. Next to them is where health really happens. And that is a, a real place. And yet, it's chaos. This is car parking. It's out, as you can see, Dundee is out in the, uh, in the fields. So you have to get a car to get there. This is Charing Cross. It no doubt had a, a plan in the middle uh, uh, that was added to and added to. And we all know what hospitals are like. They're, um, they, they have a DNA of place. They've got high streets. They've got equivalent of public squares. They're like Bologna. Uh, they, um, they add up, they accrete, uh, they become places. These are clearly not places. Uh, they are exquisitely designed, and they are deliberately not technological in that um, technology moves on here. The operating theaters of today, uh, I, I, I know we designed um, uh, for uh, the London Clinic um, uh, only five, six, seven years ago, um, cancer machines that are now outdated and will be, the new ones will be outdated. And, and, and this is a continuous refurbishment, is a continuous work on what it is to make a place. These will uh, no doubt become listed and they can afford to be listed because their technology demands are very simple. Uh, they, they are uh, standalone uh, isolated pieces. And I, 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 I just wish that we could apply that thinking to this thinking. And, and very often uh, you see uh, Rogers and Frank Gehry and Zaha winning master plans and uh, 
leading uh, 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 new parts of city making. The reality is, it's more like a, um, a, 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 mu a movie credits. When you look at who produced this hospital, it's longer than the credits on a movie because it's, it's got time element to it. A movie's made one point at a time. Who, who are the bricklayers? Who are the, uh, the people that mark the, out the car parking spaces? Who did the painting of the corridors and, and so on? And that is what makes a hospital what it is. So I was fascinated, and I've always been fascinated, about the DNA of place. What is it makes a place? How do you understand a place? Because it's un unbelievably uh, complex. It was uh, Jane Jacob that um, pioneered, I, I believe, the phrase organized complexity. And it is organized. It became, uh, became um, in chemistry and physics and mathematics uh, much more uh, common and popular. But I believe she applied it to, to the city. Uh, she intuitively divined that this, and w w this was the case with cities. And, and at the same time, she was writing her book, uh, Life and Death of American Cities. I was exploring what it is, what, where are the people in these cities? What are they doing? What, what is the three-dimensionality? And this is a drawing I made much later on uh, in Shaping London. And this is the green field, which always nature uh, begins before the city, then the roads, then the communities, and then the buildings. And I, I, I'm particularly fascinated by uh, this diagram, which I drew uh, a few years ago. Most architects, most designers would say, I see the building, I see it uh, like the Maggie Center. It's, it's a perfect thing. It stands in a field. It, it is... No, um, it is virtually context-free. Uh, but the reality is, when a tree gets into a woodland, the edge trees grow lopsided one way. The center trees get spindly with no branches at the bottom. And they become one collective. They become a collective tree. And underneath them becomes biodiversity, which you do not get in the field. Uh, and they become... <laughs> much stronger. Uh, these are the ones the hurricanes take out. These are not. And uh, I've become more interested in, um, more and more in, in the evolutionary nature of cities and the, the, the basic DNA of city making. This is a wonderful quote from the end of uh, Origin of Species by Darwin. It's interesting, and I, I will read it out, Interesting to contemplate an entangled bank and to reflect these elaborately constructed forms so different from each other and dependent upon each other in so complex a manner have all been produced by laws acting around them. There is a grandeur in this view of life. That's the, the bit that really makes my hair stand on end. From simple, uh, beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and wonderful have been, and are being evolved. I, th I thought a lot about uh, what the work of mankind is. Uh, uh, this is a man I admire very much, Philip Paul. By focusing on regions where planning has created some regularity, urban theorists have often ignored the fact that a city grows organically, not through the dictates of planners. And I, 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 I designed and worked in this um, allotment and kitchen garden. And I, I thought a lot about where the canes come from. They are, they are imported. Uh, but they make the runners green, runner beans grow better. Uh, and by having glass, which is a manufactured object, and by having greenhouses, by applying intelligence, it's a bit like town planning. You can actually improve on nature, but work with nature. And I think that's, uh, for me, is a source of inspiration. 
And if you look for the DNA place, uh, you look at um, where what patterns are. You look at the city and you say, what does the city tell us about the DNA that is working here? And this is a diagram of the River Thames. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the this is uh, Whitehall. Uh, uh, and, and going up to Knightsbridge and Oxford Street and Marylebone High Street. And it's fascinating how London segregates and orders itself socially. This is politics and, uh, 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 and aristocracy. This is upper, upper middle class. Uh, this is uh, middle class. And this is where um, the the social orders are, and the working people are, and bec between the stations, walking to work. And there are, there are seven council estates in here that are collectively uh, the size of Milton Keynes. And yet, because the boroughs are divided this way, we don't know, recognize where they are. And the other one, diagram I like uh, is, um, the, the, it is often said Lord Falsey uh, uh, was very proud of the fact that only three people in Britain understood the British Constitution, and he was one of them. And I thought, what kind of country is it when there's only three people understand the Constitution? But you don't need to understand the Constitution because you just look at the way we've organised ourselves on the land. This is monarchy. Uh, the, the, the palaces, like... Um, uh, like a footballer's family are all living uh, in the street next to them. Uh, you've got uh, Kensington, St. James Palace. Uh, and directly below them, you've got the symbolic uh, white uh, horse gods uh, and the parade. You've got uh, the ministries that are associated with, uh, with war. And you've got the cenotaph all organized around the monarchy. You've got here church and state, you've got uh, off to one side the uh, control of church and state, the, the Home Office, the uh, uh, Scotland Yard, the uh, uh, and, uh, uh, MI6, MI5. And, and you, you have right next to the government, the parliament and the church, you have the uh, absolutely literally the first building you come to that's never change since Victorian times is the Treasury. That's the important ministry. Next to it you have the Foreign Office, which has also not changed. Uh, and, and, and where, whereas environment is flung to the winds and it's been in every department and, and every uh, combination of buildings. Uh, and this is Trafalgar Square, where the people inhabit. And this is a people's place. And off to, uh, to one side, the dependence of the people, the press, the media, uh, Fleet Street, and the law courts. And I think it's very interesting how we arrange ourselves on pieces of land. And maybe this is fanciful, you may think, but I think we organize ourselves un uh, unwittingly. Uh, we organize ourselves intuitively and organically. So I... I'm going to run through 12 projects that um, uh, do this search for, um, uh, for order, uh, for a place, place being the clan, the phenomena, uh, and place telling me what it wants to do. This is a diagram I, use, uh, I drew um, at the time I was at uh, University of Pennsylvania. This, these are the people in the cars. Uh, two in some and one in most of them. This is the traffic lights at, uh, uh, at go because the people are pedestrians and their pedestrians are crossing. And these are people in, in the offices and the buildings. And that sometimes they're in a meeting room. Uh, sometimes they're walking along corridors and so on. And I looked at the choreography of what's happening on Hyde Park Corner and that I started to agitate for pedestrian crossings. Pedestrian crossings absolutely fascinate me. They really grip me about connectivity, fluidity, 
how place is made from people and uh, crossing streets and how many barriers we've created in our time by major trunk roads and motorways and railway lines uh, and so on. And by putting the crossings back on Park Lane, we've obviated that. This is, an, this is a phenomena that uh, was existing. And uh, I drew up where all the underpasses were in central London. And every underpass, you can guarantee, is a place of traffic high density. They're not trying to make, by, by designing the underpasses, they were not favoring the pedestrian. They were actually um, favoring the movement of traffic. It, uh, the underpasses are in order uh, that the traffic keeps flowing. And these were uh, the underpasses. And we, in, our, in the last 20 years, we've seen so many of them begin to uh, close uh, and become surface crossings. And it, and it goes on. The, the smart city uh, offers, uh, this is, I'd, I'd love to, uh, to get Abercrombie back now to have a look at what happens when autonomous vehicles become uh, uh, adopted. But we, we probably have traffic much closer together. We can close lanes on motorways. We can make, we don't need car parks. We can make markets. It's going to, uh, the, the, over, uh, the over design of the Abercrombie era comes back to haunt us. And, 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 and we have to look at urban motorways in Newcastle and in, in, in uh, Liverpool and, and so on. We d luckily didn't do much of it in, in London. And pedestrian crossings um, will be, uh, the, the, this is a smart cr crossing that is lit up at uh, certain times of the day uh, when, when traffic is, is a, a certain level and uh, this is, uh, uh, and we're measuring emissions now from vehicles. <coughs> Uh, we're looking at uh, self-driving cars saving money on, uh, on street lighting. Uh, we're looking at using mobile phones. This is, this is revolutionary stuff. And I took a street, um, which, uh, in, in, as I argued at the time, who, who plans or designs uh, Maribyrn Euston Road? And I couldn't find anyone who was an owner of it. TfL um, did a bit of it. Camden did a bit of it. Uh, uh, part of it was privatized. Um, and so on. The G uh, and GLA had a role. And I, I've, I've campaigned, and we've had it, added nine pedestrian crossings along it. We've made various improvements along it, particularly uh, Tottenham Court Road, uh, junction where it was laid out for buses, believe it or not. We've now laid it out for pedestrians. And um, <laughs> being in the Royal Institution where th this street, um, Albemarle Street, was reportedly the first street in London to be made one way. Uh, but I've argued for two-way streets en endlessly. And this, this is the uh, Pall Mall uh, St. James Piccadilly. I met all the different people, uh, hotels and so on, and the clubs. I argued that we had a counterflow bus lane because the gyratory was so far apart from one side to the other. You had to have a counterflow bus lane, which meant because people got knocked over frequently by the buses because they weren't expecting, you then had a railing right across, and then you've got the academy and the hotels all complaining that Fortnum and Masons and the shops, you couldn't cross the road anymore. It was a, a unbelievably uh, uh, bad uh, piece of design. And so Tottenham Court Road and Gower Street is going to be made uh, one way. And I've, I've looked at it uh, many times and uh, campaigned many times for, for one way streets to be made 
in a way. This is uh, uh, New Oxford Street, where there is virtually nothing happens on this bit of it. And what happens if you make it two way? There are overlapping gyratories on New Oxford Street. Nobody has a, a real sense of place there. And they all add up to a whole set of gyratories. Camden Town is a gyratory. Um, the, uh, uh, well, Vauxhall is one that we've been working on. Uh, Olgate, uh, somewhere in here, is now turned back to, uh, uh, and so on. The, the, these, luckily, they, these were not made into motorways, and they can be rethought. The next one uh, along the line was that I thought a lot about what's happening at King's Cross and uh, other stations. My first one was Charing Cross. And um, I, I, I've been involved in most of the railway stations in, in London, and I've increasingly persuaded and realized uh, during my lifetime they've gone from coal and, uh, and, and uh, gas works and uh, fuel depots uh, and the granary at King's Cross because the horses distributed the coal. Now, with clean energy and, 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 uh, and stations becoming part of uh, commuting and so on, they, they, stations are now part, uh, are part of city making. And I've argued that Euston is solution there and Paddington. And, and you're seeing stations becoming part of city making. And indeed, there are, there are places like Leeds where the barrier is still the, the, the station. You've seen crew, you can see crew today where the station is right dominating the city. And we've argued for, and we've been successful at HS2 can, can bring to these uh, cities a complete rethink about the shape and form. And uh, uh, if Liz, Liz can excuse me, where is she? Uh, <laughs> I can't see the bright lights. Uh, but uh, I, I got involved um, many years ago in uh, Old Oak Common. I proposed it could be the most accessible place in Europe, if not the world, and we should capitalize on. And I did the sketch for... Uh, uh, I, I invited myself in to do that transfer form, and that was the station as it was with a depot and a, a railways. And, and the brief at that time was that, as nobody lived there, the, the brief for the HS2 station, it only had doors onto the, um, uh, to the crossrail station. It didn't have doors for the po population to get into it. But that's, I describe that as um, uh, the worst cock up in 50 years. <laughs> but uh, that, that I, I believe, is now turning around. Um, <laughs> well, Liz, you'll hear, I'll hear from Liz afterwards. But I, I, it's on the mend. But we should have put the, uh, the piles in uh, when we were building the station. Uh, but I, this is integrated uh, transport with uh, Hong Kong, MTR. We can learn so much uh, from, from the new, new world uh, and the new, t the new t cities of the Far East. Uh, and we are indeed bringing MTR to the road cross rail here. This is the cultural center. This is the, we're building in front of here the... Uh, the new uh, cultural uh, building with Herzog de Moro. Next, um, Covent Garden and was the markets. There's been a complete rethink of the markets in um, uh, the three big markets, uh, Smithfield, Spitalfield, and Covent Garden, because food production, food centralization is no longer what it was. And we produced this design for Covent Garden uh, it is now, it was the basis for the, the competition brief, uh, but it is an astonishing um, uh, uh, piece of 
uh, of London. It was scheduled for demolition, and this was one of the, uh, the major uh, uh, wins of the uh, bottom-up community, uh, uh, community associations work. This, I worked for SAVE um, uh, and uh, other locals. I argued to keep these buildings around here and the market buildings in the middle. And that's the drawing I did at that time. This is it now. And this is the, these are all retained. So I, it can have effect um, working with the history of the place, working with the context and working with local people. And this is um, uh, Smithfield, where I worked initially for English Heritage, and then I appeared of, um, for Save English Heritage at my own cost uh, for uh, objecting to uh, the city making um, part of it uh, uh, offices uh, and demolishing. And I proposed at the time uh, at the English Heritage time, that this was the ideal place for, to move all the cultural buildings. And now, five, ten years later, um, they are moving uh, the, uh, the Museum of London into one of the buildings. I also uh, looked at um, Tim's Gateway, there was an organization that was governmental and was uh, 900 staff, I was told. Uh, and we came up with the vision that it's landscape-led. And we uh, argued for it. We got funding for, um, for, for, for a display, uh, which was about 2009. And then we were appointed by the government. And they put money into landscaping. They but nearly 70 million, and 70 million goes a long way in landscaping. We also, I looked at the East End and uh, I thought, what it really lacks is bridges, because th there is, a, it's, it's like a railway line or a motorway. The Thames actually is, it's, it's like a motorway that becomes an A road and becomes a B road. It, it is, there are, there are boats and ships on, on the Thames, but it's, it's minor now. The, the, the docks are empty. Uh, I think the traffic goes up and down uh, a bit, but I argued that really it, this city is to move east and there's a million people uh, projected to live on this side, then it needs communities and bridges so that you can visit your granny by bike. You can get a bus, none of which you can do at the moment. And so that was our vision for, the, um, for that. I, I backed the London uh, as a national park. Uh, I quoted these figures earlier. They are uh, some of them. 3.8 million gardens, uh, 8 million people, but uh, same number of trees, 30,000 allotments. Uh, I believe those 500 farms inside the M25. Uh, and that's, we, I worked before I came across the National Park uh, City idea, uh, which is not led by us, but we strongly support it. We uh, argued that uh, as part of Outer London, that this is uh, in Darren Rodwell's territory. Um, this is another barrier, which is the A13. And this is bridges that you connect either side of Barking uh, again. And this is airports. Airports are a, much more important than, than, than the, the aeroplanes and business. And there are parts of city making. The rejuvenation of Croydon uh, and the south coast towns will result from a different view of Gatwick. And it's about building a better London and connecting up and, and making places um, that, are, that are more workable rather than transport itself. Because planes are, are changing. They, um, 
the, the, the argument is that you need hub airports, but you need hub airports right now, just like you needed the um, Abercrombie needed his ring road right now. But in course of time, technology will change. And so you are led on to looking at all of uh, the placemaking of London. One of the things that fascinates me is that, um, and uh, I, 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 I did this work with, um, um, God, uh, uh, what, what's his name, Max? Uh, Gordon Ingram and, and Savile, uh, about the, 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 there was a prejudice, a, a bit like the Abercrombie thing, against building too close. And that is a, a, um, a, a, a legacy of TB and, uh, and, and modernist planning that buildings have to be wider apart. But if you look at where the value is, there are, it's where the narrow streets are. Nottingham Place could not be built today. Covent Garden could not be built today. And you're, th there is a funny thing that the more likely it is that your area is a conservation area and full of listed buildings, the more likely it is you couldn't reproduce it today because of the, the light angles, the distance between buildings, and so on. And uh, Paris is twice the density of London. And this is ex uh, and this, uh, no further south. It's got the same latitude. And th these, these are Paris streets. And you need all this to make the shops and the markets work. That's why they are so successful in Paris. And so uh, we, we did a very early scheme, cracking them into the, the, about the towers. We've done a lot of work on how you can comply uh, with the angled windows and so on. But basically, we've got to rethink uh, the advice that's given on widths of streets and so on. And we've done quite a lot of work on that. And uh, finally, um, finally, in this section of initiatives, uh, we'll end up on post-industrial uh, regeneration. I think we lived the last 50 years of a huge change in what constitutes our industry. And this is, uh, I, I love these uh, aerial plans. This is Newcastle Quayside then and now. And the, I was saying earlier, there's, there's, there's the, 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 there is the concert hall designed by uh, Foster. There's the Baltic. Uh, there, there is the new bridge. Uh, and this is the new layout, which we did. Uh, but it's, it's gone. It, it's... It's a trigger beyond the, the red line. It, it has grown and grown. This is Brindley Place. That was how it was. This was the master plan. This is how it is today. And it's an extraordinary transformation of canals and industry. And the same is happening. Uh, this is uh, uh, Paddington Central. Uh, Paddington Central there. Paddington Basin. And uh, as it is now. Or... Is, is, is growing. And the final things are of the review, uh, uh, and Finn Williams will comment on this. Uh, we have, uh, I think, quite a, a lot of successes. Urban rooms, uh, we, we deliberately di didn't argue for it being uh, party political. In fact, we worked for nothing on it because we particularly liked the, the fact that it wasn't a, uh, a Tory-sponsored uh, uh, um, uh, uh, review. And we argued with, with the acronym of Planning, Landscape, Architecture, Conservation, and Engineering in each place. But you could equally have politics, law, uh, and I can't think of another one for architecture, but you could have construction and ecology. Uh, but <coughs> it, uh, and urban rooms are growing again and again. But conclusion, we live in a, a time of extraordinary city making. It's the biggest industry on the planet. These are the, um, this is the growth of urbanization. 42% growth in China and India, 
85% uh, of Brazil of people that are moving from, uh, from, uh, from the, uh, for the country to the urban area and the growth, natural growth in the urban area. And London itself has added an Edinburgh in the last five years. We'll add a, a, a Birmingham by 2025, and I'm told we'll add a Scotland uh, by, by the middle of this century. And we are living in a time of incredible city building, but they are not, these cities are not built by uh, town planners, they're not built by architects, they're built by many different parties, many different hands. What role does development control have? This is development control. I think we have an extraordinary idea about what uh, makes up, uh, what our vision of London is. We have iconic buildings that are totally separate from each other, and yet this is all governed by development control. We have a very standardized city, like Hong Kong, but they can build a shopping center which would never, this is a, a ship, <laughs> believe it or not, that is a shopping center. And you would never get consent in this environment for a ship as a, but you also have a repetition of, th these, are, these are cultural, deep cultural differences uh, of an extraordinary kind. Final two slides, one third of the world's new urban dwellers live in slums. But that doesn't mean it's spread evenly. There are two thirds in Mumbai live in slums. And of course, laws, when they destroy, whether we did in uh, uh, bombing Germany or Germany bombing us, or whatever, go, go, wherever bombings take place, it's the the, the cities that get, they get um, the hell knocked out of them because they're the depository of memories, of culture, uh, and uh, ongoing uh, civilization and identity. And it's, this is an act of identity destruction of a collective kind. And from this grows a kind of identity because from that football field comes the Maradonas of the future. And, the aspiration of all these people looking to um, grow beyond what they have today. There are just a few thoughts. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. very much indeed and we will of course thank you again at the end but I'm going to invite the panellists now to come and join me here. Please come and take a seat. I'll invite you to welcome them in a minute but first I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Before you react to what Terry said, please just tell us who you are and when you first met Terry, if you can remember. <laughs> so Jules, you're first. Uh, Jules Pine, um, I'm the Deputy Mayor for um, Planning Regeneration Skills at the GLA. Um, I, I don't know when the first time we met, but obviously I knew of Terry probably when I was still at college, I would have helped. So. Thank you. Darren? Um, leader of Bagnum, Bagnum, I first met Terry uh, after meeting uh, Max at Mipping Centre, terrible uh, the food was. Um, and uh, later on he said, oh, you've got to speak to my dad, you're quite an interesting character. And uh, I met him at the wonderful airplane factory, which I thought was quite yeah. impressive, actually. Finn? Uh, Finn Williams, I'm the uh, chief, chief of the executive of public practice as of last week, which is why I can't say it yet. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I, I, I met, I was lucky enough to meet Terry as a student. Um, and uh, was I, d I don't quite then realise what level of impact um, he'd have on my career, uh, and um, yeah, and still continues to have now. Liz, 
Uh, I'm Liz Peace. I used to be Chief Executive of the British Property Federation. I retired a few years ago. I do a number of things, um, amongst the one for which um, Terry name-checked me tonight, which is chairing the Mayoral Development Corporation at Old Oak and Park Royal, which we may get onto in discussion. Uh, well, I can remember the very first meeting with Terry, which was just a, a, a private dinner with a mutual friend, but the second one was much more interesting because it was at the Tower of London. And Terry was talking to us about how if we actually opened up the Tower of London so people could actually move through it freely, it could become the village green of London. And I thought this was such a brilliant idea. And then I realized subsequently, of course, Terry liked throwing in these really interesting ideas to <laughs> stir up people's thinking. But that one has always stuck with me. Mm. Might hear more about that later, Terry. Um, uh, I'm Greg Clark. I've known Terry, I guess, for about 20 mm. years. Became an instant fan. And um, I'm still a fan today. So really nice to, to be here with you, Terry. So Terry's talked to us about the DNA of place, place as a client. Uh, the place and its relationship to memory, culture, and identity. We talked about organized complexity, pattern searching, the organic evolution of place, the grandeur of the pattern of cities, and the work of mankind. So it was a pretty small agenda that he, uh, he took us through. And he talked about streets and stations and markets and rivers and place making and landscaping and bridges and airports and development control and density and post-industrial regeneration, and slums, and poverty, and aspiration, and so much more. So panelists, why don't you take three minutes each to give a reaction to what you heard? And I guess my question is, what did you hear in what Terry said that was important from your point of view? And Jules, if you will, we'd love you to go first. Well, every slide, every, every, each of the 12 themes uh, was struck me as something that uh, is crucial to, to London and crucial to, to getting right, whether it's helping nudge that organic process along in the right direction or perhaps sometimes dictat. Um, and it's certainly the London plan, the new London plan that I'll be bringing uh, forward uh, on behalf of the mayor that he'll be launching in a few weeks' time, um, I think addr addresses and speaks to everyone of those themes, and I uh, like to think in a, in a positive way um, every time. Um, I, I think the, the only detail, perhaps, perhaps each of those bridges along the, uh, along the, uh, e the Thames in the east perhaps might not be uh, low level. That's probably still an argument to come. But I think on every, every other point, I, I think we can, um, we can really respond positively to each one of those themes. Certainly, I, I'll just pick out one, because we only got three minutes, and I think that the, the um, penultimate uh, theme on high-density, uh, mid-rise living. Um, we've got to make better use, we've desperately got to make better use of land um, in London than uh, we currently do. And to be able to get that right uh, means that design, and good design, designing for people, um, designing uh, for employment, designing for minimizing the need to travel between work and home to get those designs of homes right so that um, uh, one's not imposing one's own life onto, onto one's neighbor. Um, getting those places to work well, but our high density in the way that you spoke about, the example of Paris, um, that's, that's gonna be crucial going forward. Great, and Georgie might ask you later what you think's needed to make that possible. We'll come back to that. Darren, can we come to you? What did you hear or see in what Terry said that was important? To me, it was uh, Terry was talking about the lifeblood of, of the villages, the 32 villages that make up London, and the way they all interact with each other, and the fact that the person has to be at the center of whatever is designed, designed or, or built. And uh, this is where me and Jules obviously uh, uh, love him to pieces, but I will disagree with him. I, I actually think the low bridge idea, and in fact, it was the first time, <laughs> second time I met with Terry, uh, I was absolutely bought into the idea that the east of London could be transformed by those nine bridges all the way out to South End, and, and, uh, and I believe that for what we need to do, as a city, uh, as the southeast region, we need to look at how we can allow 
for crossings to happen which don't actually uh, take away from the places themselves. Uh, so I, I'm a firm believer that um, the river should be enhanced by the fact that if we were able to interlock the regeneration of that aspiration of the, the villages that have also uh, led uh, for centuries along the river uh, estuary, um, actually we could build a much stronger and vibrant city uh, moving forward. So um, I've always believed uh, that the places are built by people, for people, uh, not by uh, institutions. Normally institutions get it wrong and then it's left to the people to sort out the mess. Darren, thank you very much indeed. Finn, will you pick it up? What did Terry say that struck you as important or significant? Uh, for me, it's the, it's the analogy of the, the Maggie Centre versus the hospital is a really powerful one and is, and is, is something I got from speaking to Terry, even sort of meeting him the first time as a student, this commitment to uh, making the ordinary better in a context when a lot of other architects I was perhaps looking up to were, was, were competing to make um, ever more extraordinary buildings um, that really, uh, I, I suppose, served a, a, a small fraction of society or represented a small percentage of the built environment. And um, I mean, I, I, think, I think it goes back to a point, a point in Terry's career uh, a, a bit before uh, I was born in 1961 when Terry made the decision, you know, to, when he was doing his year out placement, to rather than work for, I think he turned down a job for Dennis Lasden, decided to work for the LCC Architects Department, um, and ended up sitting next to someone who, who turned out to be, to be uh, Nicholas Grimshaw. And there's something really extraordinary uh, about that for me as someone um, who didn't graduate that long ago. Uh, the, the idea um, that you could have such talent um, working to design very everyday infrastructure like the Blackwall Tunnel ventilation buildings. Um, and, and when I graduated uh, from architecture a few, a few years later, um, uh, people still found it, well, people at that stage found, found it very hard to believe um, that I would actually choose to work for Croydon Council over a big name architect. Um, and I think, you know, what, what I learned then from the uh, really extraordinary conditions I had working at Croydon through the leadership of John Rouse, working with a very talented team, um, was that it's, it can be an amazing job. You can work in that rest of the borough environment, the ordinary, and make the ordinary better, um, which is why I decided to set up public practice. And Terry was really helpful um, for me uh, developing the model and, and obviously building it into the Fowler Review. But I think beyond that, um, his whole career is a, is a kind of in inspiration in terms of um, that commitment to improving the, the everyday built environment. And, I th you know, th there was uh, one, one of my favourite projects of Terry, Terry's was actually a teaching project he did in the, in the 70s when everyone else at the Architectural Association, I think it was the 70s, Everyone else at the Architectural Association, Rem Kulhas, Zaha Hadid, were doing some amazing sci-fi deconstructivist visions. Terry was teaching learning from Chigwell. <laughs> and, uh, and, um, you know, and, and that's what, that, those are the kind of designers and architects and planners that public practice is for. It's for, for people who um, are less interested in creating kind of exceptions to the norm and more interested in working to raise uh, the standards of normality itself. Hear, hear. Thank you very much. <coughs> Liz. What did you hear in what Terry said that struck you as very important? Well, I mean, there were there were, there were so many things that you could you could pick up. Um, the, the first one I, I thought about was the the city as a real cradle to grave experience. Terry actually pointed out the cemetery as well mm. as the hospital where mm. people are born. But but also coming out of that, the the integration, wanting houses next to industry, don't separate out lots of different functions. Um, I love the concept of, or the idea of the importance of uh, pedestrian crossings. And, and actually the, the problems of development actually creating barriers, mm. uh, which I think it's so, it so often does. And so often we see buildings in a sort of citadel, which you can't get into and out of. Um, I was going to sort of talk a little bit about the, the, the prejudice against building too close, which I thought was a great idea, but Jules has sort of put me to that one. Mm. So I'm gonna focus on the one that probably is most relevant to what I'm trying to do at, uh, at Old Oak. And this is looking at stations as the, as the part of city making. Mm. And of course, stations are hugely important at Old Oak Common. 
Uh, it's not just the HS2 and the Crossrail station. By the time we finish, there's going to be something like nine stations. But what's quite extraordinary is, despite nine stations, nobody can get into or out of the place. <laughs> so, so actually, what you what you have to look at is how you overcome the barriers that so much of the uh, so, so much of our development buildings infrastructure actually creates. It's no good just having the infrastructure. It's actually working out how to how to use it. So, for example, in the context of Old Oak Common, what's really important, which picks up another of Terry's themes, are bridges. Mm. So, in the north, south, east, west, we're going to need bridges to get over some of this stuff in order for people to get into and out of it and to be able to move freely. Mm. Uh, and I, that, I think, is, is probably one of the, the most interesting things. And we won't talk about the Crossrail Depot. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, in a minute I'm going to give you a right of reply and I'm also going to invite everybody in the room to contribute to the conversation but I want to ask the, the panel one more question which is, it essentially goes like this that you know, Terry has set out um, a hugely inspiring <coughs> vision that's very much focused on people and place and uh, a view of how the world changes which is based on intuition and the observation of pattern and the underlying order of things so What's needed now to secure this kind of vision and the way we make places going forward? And Liz, I'm going to ask you to comment on that first. Well, uh, I suppose probably the, the thing I'd pick out would be the, the need for the public and private sector to actually come together to make these things happen. Uh, because my career has spanned both. Um, I actually believe very strongly in each learning from the other. Uh, I don't think uh, either has the monopoly on, on wisdom or making things happen. Um, but, of course, we talk about this public-private partnership as a, I mean, it's become a bit of a truism. Everybody mm. sort of says it needs to happen. Mm. But, but it isn't actually that simple because I think you do, you do get a fundamental mismatch of philosophy mm. and, a, and a, fundamental a fundamental misunderstanding of each. I remember somebody I, I, I met in my early years in the property industry who was actually working for, for the Civic Trust at the time and he'd been brought in to help um, a particular developer who was trying to build a shopping centre in Guildford. And, and the good burghers of Guildford City Council just did not get this and had actually you know, turned down the proposition 14-0. Terry not even wasn't a, working for it. This though. was not Terry's project. Okay, good. But, but the, you know, <laughs> it, I, I think it just showed this fundamental lack of communication between a somewhat brash, I was about to say Australian developer, but that would give the game away, wouldn't it? So, <laughs> oh dear, uh, I'll, I'll shut up straight away. But, but this, is, this is my point about this, this fundamental lack of, lack of misunderstanding. And I think it's exacerbated also by an assumption that in times of government and local government cutbacks, somehow or other the private sector can pay for everything. So the private sector feel they're misunderstood, they have everything piled on top of them, and, and the public sector um, don't, really, don't really get what the private sector is doing and vice versa. So very quickly, what could we actually do to make, mm. make that happen? And this is the sort of thing that Terry has spent a, a lifetime trying to make happen, working for both sides, um, engaging really early, mm. working out shared objectives, mm. exchanging people. You know, we need to see more movement of people between, between public mm. and private sector. Uh, we need to take a cooperative view of accessing funding. Mm. And there are many different ways of accessing funding, both public and private sector funding. And then I think for owners of capital, for owners of buildings, they really genuinely have to learn to be patient. That capital has to be patient. They have to be prepared to put money up front to make things happen. And for local authorities, and I'm sorry, Darren, they have to try and think beyond the next election. Mm. Thank you. Right, great. So this is going to get quite juicy, isn't it? Let's keep going. Finn, what do you think is needed to secure this vision that uh, Terry has set out? Um, one thing we talked about in the Fowler Review, uh, which certainly I felt from my experience of working somewhere like Croydon, is you can have the right people in place and they can work around, the, have the wrong policies, but the right policies don't necessarily work around having the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And um, if, uh, if it comes back to your point, there's about this, uh, the, the, an emerging a gap, and in particular a skills gap between the mm -hmm. public and private sector and the need to exchange people. Um, mm -hmm and skills and knowledge and ideas um, between both of them. Um, and I hope one thing that will start to help, certainly won't solve it in its own right, is this new initiative, uh, Public Practice, uh, which we're actually launching at the end of this month, um, that Ter Terry's brought into being, I suppose, through the, through the Fowler Review. And, and the, the simple way of describing it is a kind of teach first for planning. Mm. Um, so 
it's a way of not so much uh, recreating the LCC's architecture department, but completely reinventing um, okay, what public practice, what pub public planning is for the 21st century. Um, so there'll be outstanding planners, placemakers, architects uh, working on year-long placements within local authorities alongside uh, a program of, of uh, collective research and development. Um, and, and in a way, it's trying to recreate uh, a more rounded interdisciplinary role of both planning and architecture that Terry's career represents, and actually, hopefully, um, uh, creating new ways uh, for people from a broader mix of backgrounds, a broader mix of skills, and, and, uh, um, uh, and a more diverse cohort coming into the profession as well. And that's something Terry's been a real champion of, um, as, uh, having planners who really understand the places that they're serving. Um, who grew up, who've grown up in a, in a normal environment, as, as Terry would say he, he has in, in, Berman, in, uh, in Newcastle. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so we're, we're launching at the end of the month. I'm pleased to say we've got the support of the GLA, um, as well as the LGA, Future Cities, Catapult, Barclay Group, British Land, Peabody. We've got Jules as our chair. Um, so I've stolen Jules's ability to use that. Um, and, and hopefully in that first cohort, um, there might be... Be, uh, might be a new generation of, of Terry's um, working their way into local authorities. Wonderful. And I guess one of the outcomes will be that many more people working in all parts of the economy will have some experience of planning, yeah. too. Mm, yeah. So that'd be good. Darren, what do you see is needed to secure the kind of vision that uh, Terry was setting out? Um, you need to stop national politicians messing it up for the rest of us. Um, <laughs> that's the short answer. The long answer is um, starting in a vision that is actually a, a lifetime vision. Um, Terry's, Terry's proved that, um, that these concepts don't get done in a four-year cycle. Uh, I don't see myself as a politician. I see myself as a community champion, and my job is to serve the community that I, I represent. And um, I very much brought that into the practice of, of the council. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, two triangles, actually. The first one is about the place and um, the job of the public sector in the 21st century is, is to um, sort of facilitate where the community's vision is and, that, and that's, uh, that's a very interesting role because actually for the last 50 years we've been the parent and that's the wrong role because actually most people are empowered enough to know what they want and, and Terry's shown that in a lot of design of, around the globe. Um, so, so the job of the council is, is, or local government, is to facilitate the vision of the community for the community to say, this is what we want. Because they, they've got to be embedded in every aspect of, of the new design. Um, but it's also the job of a local uh, authority to find the right partners mm -hmm. who will sign up to that vision. And I was having a conversation with someone earlier when they said, oh, it's not for the private sector to do public sector's job. Well, let's be honest about it. You're asking the public sector now to do the private sector's job because you failed in building the housing for all. Now you've got to come back to the people that know how to do it, and we've been doing it for centuries. So, so it's about getting a joint-up piece of thinking. Now, for my officers, what does it mean to be an officer in the 21st century? Well, it actually means now that you've got to keep the values of why you come in to serve. At the same time, though, you've got to be commercial enough to know that you either streamline or you don't make it a cost uh, to the authority as, uh, or as little cost as possible, but you don't do it on the backs of vulnerable people. Um, and at the same time, you have to be as versatile as possible as in the voluntary sector. If you link that together, what do you actually produce? Well, you produce B First. And B First is our company that's owned by us as the shareholder, the council as the shareholder, but it's chaired by Lord's, uh, Lord Kerslake, and some would say he's had a bit of a reputation in, in, in these areas, uh, and, and sponsored by partners like the GLA and TFL and Network Rail about building place. Um, and then actually with that, what you've got is you've got a private company that has the public sector values, but the shareholders of the people. And that's how you're going to build out what is the vision I see that Terry has shown us uh, over a long period sustained career uh, of the tomorrow. So it doesn't matter if I'm not elected next year, which I hope I will be and I'll still be the leader, but that's the vision that London needs to embrace uh, where we all work together for a collective value 
of tomorrow's, uh, tomorrow's city. Darren, thank you very much. Jules, your reflections. What's needed to secure the vision that Terry was setting out? Uh, I'd, I'd say two things. Um, the first is plays very much to what Darren uh, was just saying. Um, yes, we need vision, but we need leadership to articulate that vision. Uh, leadership from City Hall, um, city-wide leadership, and leadership from uh, the 32 boroughs and the Corporation uh, of, of London. And some step up, some don't step up. Darren's definitely one, as you can hear, certainly does step up uh, to, that, uh, uh, to, that, to that role. So they need to articulate, all those players need to articulate the needs of Londoners, articulate a, lo a vision for their place. Certainly the mayor is going to um, articulate that um, through uh, the London plan, uh, because I think you have to build support, and that's a crucial thing. You need, as Darren was saying, build public support, uh, support from the private sector, support from national government, particularly the Treasury. Uh, and that's my second one, which I'll come to. Um, <laughs> And, and certainly what the, the mayor wants to see, um, as they articulated through the London plan, will be about building strong and inclusive communities, <coughs> making better use of land, in fact, the best use of land that, that we can, creating a much healthier city that isn't poisoning itself uh, with its air, desperately delivering, uh, rather delivering the, the homes that uh, Londoners uh, so desperately uh, need, particularly affordable uh, homes, growing a good economy, uh, we always talk about growing the economy, but when do we talk about growing an economy that benefits everyone, particularly those who are at the bottom who are helping to grow that economy, instead of just the few? When we do developments, it shouldn't be just about the people who are bringing the development in and the people moving in in that development. It should be about what's that development doing um, for people who are already living in that place. Um, and you know, increasing our efficiency so we are not so wasteful for resources, and in turn, um, protecting ourselves better with, with better resilience uh, to all sorts, whether it's man-made threats, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, natural natural threats. Um, so, and so, my second thing is um, is all about infrastructure. Um, uh, I think Liz was saying that I very much agree with her. The private sector isn't going to be able. To, uh, to deliver all that just on the back of profits of developments. The only way we can do that is if we only build private housing and double the price, and who's going to buy it then uh, from uh, with the way the economy is going currently um, and the decision about uh, to, to, to leave the EU. Um, I, I don't know when it happened. I, I, I think I missed it when governments um, decided that they were getting out of the game of um, investing in the future. Uh, and just leaving it to be extracted out of private developments. Um, I find it remarkable that we, we still have to remind people about the Jubilee Line extension. It's almost as if uh, you know, every single uh, investment in transport apparently gives no returns, is completely wasteful, it's utterly pointless, um, and it's a drain on the economy to, to build any of this stuff. Um, and all the jobs and growth it creates, apparently we never see the taxes uh, back from that. And, but that's certainly how government after government um, be, be behaves. Um, so we, we need uh, funding for infrastructure. We need governments to realise that it is actually an investment. Um, and, and it's not just an investment that sees uh, returns. It's an investment um, that prevents negatives uh, being visited on a... On a, on a city as well. And we need much longer term and holistic takes on um, investment. Uh, Terry brightly um, uh, identified the, the cock up of the uh, half century, I think you said it was. Um, uh, the, the next half century's cock up could, on, related actually to that, could be uh, Euston Station. Mm. The determination of people to, well, you know, to, Crossrail to do we do we do we need to actually have an integrated station there? It could be the other side of the road, but no one will mind coming out of one station, crossing a road, and going in another. Can we, is it really? Well, we've got, so we've got two stations together, not three. Isn't that good enough? Okay, they're on different levels, and maybe they'll be a bit difficult to get between. And I see the half an hour you'll save on your journey coming from the north will be wasted trying to get out of the station. <laughs> um, um, and and we're going to make those same mistakes again unless we take this kind of longer term holistic. Uh, view about about these and and that they are investments and investments that work on many in on many different levels of the word investment for the future. Jules, thank you very much indeed.
Terry, before we invite everybody to join in, is there anything you want to say in response to what you've heard? Uh, I, uh, I think uh, I'd rather others contribute. Okay. Great. So with your blessing, Terry, what I'd like to do is invite anyone who wants <coughs> to ask a question or make a remark to do so. I only ask that you be brief and that you do it now. Don't wait. And what we'll do is we'll take as many comments as we can from around the room. Our panellists and Terry will make little notes and then I'll invite them to respond to a couple each. And that way everyone will get their say. So you were first, so you were second. It's not compulsory to be male to make a point, but you're next and then there's you. So over you. Yes, sir. What's your one big question? One big question is how many gardens will there be in oh. the Lovely, yeah. okay. Yeah. Who was over here? Yeah. You, sir. Yes. Uh, my name is Nicholas Boysmith. I run Terry Street. My big question is, I think there's only one thing missing from Terry, your, your list, which was beauty. I think that should have been the 13th thing on the list. We know from some of our work from neuroscience films, correlation of nerve morphology and value and happiness. And actually, you can predict beauty. Remarkable confidence. And you can predict what people would like. And that is something you should be building into Lovely, thank you. You, sir? My question was, you spoke, uh, spoke very heroically about the huge range of people that contributed to all of this. What's your recipe for effective orchestration? Ah, effective orchestration, Terry, that's the question. Richard? Okay, do space standards need to be revised? Who else is waiting? Anyone else? You're next, sir. Still want to say it's not compulsory to be male, but there we are. Yes, sir. How do you get over the problem of a hospital to visit that suspicious and mostly hopefully hostile to almost any development that is proposed, whether it's infrastructure or housing or any other development? That sounds like Darren and... Uh, uh, Jules's everyday life, thinking about things like that. Who was next? There's somebody else was waiting. Yes, madam. <laughs> Recipe for Houston. Okay. Anyone else waiting? Right. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. So, Old Oak Common, what about beauty? What's the recipe for orchestration? Do we need to change space standards to meet London's housing targets? What about a populace that's suspicious of development? How do you, re re how do you re react to them? And then uh, what should we do with Euston? So maybe what we should do is, uh, Terry, would you agree we let the panel reply to a couple of points each and then you have the last word and make your comments? <coughs> would that well, work? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be last. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, Jules, are you happy to kick off? Will you take two of those points and react to them? Oh, uh, which two? They are all such good questions. I'll take an easy one, that's space standards. Uh, no, uh, they're minimums. What's in, what's in the plans are minimums, and they are minimums for a reason, and they've been well calculated. Um, I think, and actually I think it links to the first point, uh, one of the early, slightly earlier point about beauty, um, and what I said about good design. Um, we need to get denser, um, and we need to put a lot of effort into the design to make those denser places work. But that does not mean to say that we should be giving people's personal space, uh, should be giving them less personal space with inside flats uh, and homes and houses. We can, it, it, it is person, perfectly possible to be able to deliver denser, closer developments um, with access to green space uh, that, are, uh, that uplift the spirits um, but that shouldn't be at the expense of once you close the door behind you, um, you have somewhere the size of this desk in between uh, uh, your, where you cook and your bed and where you uh, sit perhaps to watch um, TV. And the thing is that I have seen some things brought forward to City Hall in my brief time there that d does give walking space that isn't much bigger than uh, this uh, table. And I think it is in my view. Mm. But it's the Mayor's London plan, not mine, so. 
so, um, how do you overcome a populist? Um, comes back to my point about building the, uh, the importance of leadership and building support. Um, if, if, though, the local despot is the local leader who is against any development, then I guess you have a problem. Um, but then that's about um, those people who know better building, uh, building that support um, uh, and, and articulating uh, the case. Because, you know, I, I think back to the sort of the Abercrombie plan, people were writing great pamphlets, uh, populist pam pamphlets, about explaining uh, the, uh, the Abercrombie plan uh, to Londoners back in uh, 1944 and 45, um, and and I hope to do the same um, with the London plan, this London plan as well. That uh, it needs to be more accessible. I mean, I, I, I think I fail if my test is that you know down every pub on a Saturday night they're discussing the finer points of the London plan, although that would be nice. <laughs> but I think perhaps we need to get. The, uh, the, the debates and the discussions that we're having about the things, the issues here in this room tonight, they need to be more widely shared um, outside of the architecture pages of The Guardian. Mm. Uh, we need to have uh, a far more common debate um, in, in this country about what needs to happen uh, to make this country work and actually to give more people a better life than they currently do. Jules, thank you very much. Darren, will you take two? Oh, he's taking the ones that were probably best suited for me. But um, beauty. beauty. I want to hear your bit on the despot, though, on the uh, <laughs> on the overcoming the populace. So. Um, beauty is in the, the eye of the, of the beholder, and I've seen some stuff in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'm not sure what they were on at the time, and I'm not sure Terry was one of those. But um, uh, he definitely wasn't. I, I gather so from some of the designs I've seen. His are far, far better. Um, but uh, I. I struggle because um, it's about community. So if we, if we talk about anything we do, the, the beauty of a village green is the beauty of the village green, and everything goes around whatever that, that space is. Um, and that's how London sort of organically grew. And those beauties are still there. You've just got to find them. And actually, there shouldn't be a fight between the existing and the new. And we've, we've really done that wrong in, in, in London, uh, so much so that, that, that every, every council virtually gets accused of gentrification. And that's because we've forgotten about the original people. We've forgotten about the Londoner. And that Londoner may be the Londoner who turned up yesterday or the Londoner that's lived there for generations. And um, we've got to give people the right to rent again. We've got to give people the right to live their life in the way that they feel uh, and see is fit, in a way that inspires them. So we don't want rabbit hutches, but we do need to talk about, there is a, a group of Londoners, and I call them TWA, temporary workers. They're temporary workers and they need accommodation. They're not gonna engage like a street as we would know it. So there has to be a proper discussion about what does that mean? Because by not engaging in that, that discussion, what we're doing is letting down the very people that are already existing in this great city of ours. And I'll give you the example that a three-bedroom Dagnum house sometimes holds 35 people in it. Now, are those people living? Or are they just surviving? Are the people around them <coughs> living? Or are they finding that their lifestyle is being totally impeded by greed. So actually, it's about our values as a collective great world city. And, and I, I've, I've got to be honest, beauty, sizes, bringing the community, it's about the value of London. And London's always been good at having the right value. And I'll, I'll always say that the British people have always been good. And this, this might sound a bit off, but actually, when young Terry was growing up on that housing estate, he was inspired by the men and women who fought a war. And after that war, collectively they grew, and it didn't matter what political party it was, but they believed in four things. Everyone deserved the right to have a decent home. Everyone deserved the right to have good education for free all the way up to university and then invest in this country. Everyone had the right, if they were real, to get the hope and help they needed to survive. That's called the NHS. 
And the last one was our most vulnerable were just as important as the richest, and we had the welfare state. Mm. Over the last 40 years, we've lost that collective responsibility we should have had, and we've gone too far down the road of self. And that's how you get gated communities, short-mindedness, and how much money can I make on a space, as we see in London today. And that's killing the greatest city in the world. That would be my way of putting it all together. Darren, thank you very much. Finn, your reflections, two points. Um, I think there's a, uh, like to draw out the link perhaps between the hostility to new development and perhaps um, either aesthetic values of beauty or, or what people see they're getting from new development uh, in London and I think, um, and, and beyond. I think that <coughs> the approach that Terry set out uh, his whole approach to his career is, is this kind of respect of planning and, and design with respect for the people and the places that are already there um, and starting with those, those wider places. Um, so uh, the, that, that is much more about what starting with the communities and really understanding them before you even put pen to paper in theory. Um, you know, Ter Terry's also talked about, I think, quite, the ra quite radical ways he's been a kind of advocate or activist uh, for community groups and, and even a kind of advocate for those places over the long term. For, like, who else is standing up for the Euston Road? Who else is, uh, is, is really thinking about Covent Garden? And, and for me, that's the really, uh, the really interesting question about it, uh, particularly as a, as a kind of public servant, as um, someone who's setting up public practice, uh, is, I think Terry put in the Farrell review, who does the joining up um, nowadays? And um, I, I think that's where planning uh, can make such a difference. It, it can really afford to think long-term beyond the immediate reactions uh, mm -hmm. from a specific, very vocal community. It can think about a broader place um, beyond uh, the person over the, over the fence who's complaining about one change of their view. And it can um, uh, afford to think much longer term beyond um, economic or political cycles. Finn, thank you. Liz, your reflection? Right, a couple of very quick ones. I know exactly why Peter asked the question he did about how many gardens are there going to be in Old Oak because he and I have had this discussion about density, um, low-rise low buildings, proper houses, as opposed to our obsession with tall apartment blocks. We're going to be building apartment blocks in, in Old Oak because we need the numbers there. Um, we're going to work very, very hard to make it um, well-designed and there will be a lot of garden squares. Mm. And don't forget, we also have on our doorstep one of the uh, most unspoilt green spaces mm. in London. It's called Wormwood Scrubs, and not an awful lot of people know about it or even go there. Mm. So um, I'm actually a well, Those who go there don't want to. Or, or <laughs> you're, you're worrying, you're, well, oh, that bit of Wormwood Scrubs, <laughs> absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, we will do our best to make sure this mm. isn't just a, a, a series of glass towers. <coughs> just picking up very quickly on populous, um, the popular objection, mm. um, at the time of the London Real Estate Forum earlier in the year, there was a very interesting article in a, a certain well-known journal actually written by one of the protesters from outside, one of those who'd been shouting scum at all the developers as mm. they walked in. And I mean, what he was actually saying is don't always assume you're doing good by the local community by knocking things down. Mm. There are people there. You have to think about what they have got already mm. and what they actually want to preserve. Mm. Wholesale estate regeneration may not be the answer, and I think we have to be a lot more sympathetic to that point of view. Mm. Thank you very much, Liz. Terry, an opportunity for you now to give any kind of repost you like before we accept Max's invitation to go and have drinks and canapes. Uh, well, um, I will comment on each of them. Um, I, I am sympathetic to um, Liz's point about um, apartments rather than houses. I, I feel it's the trees and the number of trees that's important rather than gardens. Um, I, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that there's eight and a half million trees in London and there are eight and a half million people living here. So I would have a rule, if I was mayor, uh, that every person extra in London, you have a tree. So that the number of the population equals the number of trees. And I, I think that, that that's how I'd answer that one. I think the beauty one, we, uh, I, I was in um, 
<coughs> Seoul, of all places, in Korea. And I was looking out of a window, and I was in collaboration with various architects on the master plan. And Rem Kulhas came over to me, and he looked out the window. And I, uh, there was a motorway below us, and it was going dark. And after a while, it went darker, and he said, that's very beautiful. Mm. And I was taken aback because I'd seen the motorway in daylight. And actually, it was beautiful. Mm. And I suddenly looked at that with new eyes. And I think that new eyes and the eyes of the beholder, uh, and, and I know, uh, and I know what uh, underpins a lot of the arguments for beauty um, from a, uh, a particular section of, of argument. But I, I've found that o over time, in English heritage, uh, I was on various committees listing buildings and so on. And it changed, and brutalism, I really didn't like. But I began to see with new eyes, uh, and because there are so many young architects today that have opened my eyes, just like Rem Kool has did with the motorway. And actually, I look back to a time when my earlier uh, generation of architects to me thought everything Victorian should be pulled down. Mm. And th then I realized there's beauty in Victoria. And I think we have to really hesitate uh, before we call something ugly something beautiful. Mm. Uh, that's my comment. I think the, the most interesting question is for the Town Planning Institute and, and, and so on, is how do you get an effective orchestration? What is the recipe for this? Mm. I think it's both ends have to work at it. I think with smart cities and uh, uh, increased democratization through your mobile phone uh, the, uh, and, and, and other methods of digitization, it is possible to get people's views without the planning committee uh, being present uh, by passing them, as with, with all democratic processes. But the contrary one is, I think that all leaders of um, our prime minister, our mayor, our uh, borough leaders, they are all they've got to see themselves as the chief town planning officer. Mm. They, they are the urban city makers mm. of our time. Mm. And unless they do, they, we are lost in leadership terms. Mm. And um, that, that's my comment on that. I think space and density, and uh, I, I, I think density... It's how, it's how you do it. I don't think there's, uh, there are tiny spaces. I, I got fascinated as uh, a young architect by mobile homes and, and, and people on boats. And the rules that applied to them didn't apply to houses. And people loved them. Of those that loved them, but loved them. Um, but I don't think it's possible to prescribe density or minimal space, it's how you do it mm -hmm. and how well you do it. Um, I, th I, th I, uh, I think, uh, commenting on Euston, I would just say that Euston is a piece of city making first and a railway station second. 60% mm -hmm. of the people that go Apparently, I'm told, don't know where the statistic comes from, but I'm prepared to believe it, 60% of the people that go to St. Pancras Station, called by the French Minister of Transport, the mu most beautiful railway station in the world, 60% of them don't go to catch trains. Mm.
<laughs> Terry, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gents, before we go and enjoy uh, the hospitality that Max invited us to, let's firstly thank our host, Max Farrell, and the RTPI president, Stephen Wilkinson, for his valedictory address. <laughs> And then let's thank, if we may, the Deputy Mayor of London, Jules Pipe, the leader of the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, Councillor Dallin Rodwell, Finn Williams and Liz Peace. Thank you very much. <laughs> And then let's once again recognise our gold medalist, Sir Terry Farrell.